New York City now. Morning everybody and it's really good to uh, be opening this uh, webinar today. I'm not sure where you all are but it's a pretty miserable day here in, uh, here in London. I sound like a radio presenter here, <laughs> about to do a jingle or something. But it's really good to have you all here. I'm looking forward to a really uh, interactive uh, hour with, uh, and I'll be picking up some themes, and some key issues as we, as we go along. This is all about the uh, rather unattractively titled integrated logic model, uh, which is really a tool whereby localities can uh, uh, examine how they are uh, managing the integration agenda right through from inputs to actually what really matters, of course, which is outcomes. My name is Tony Hunter. I'm the chief executive here at uh, Sky and a social worker by uh, background. This webinar is part of the uh, Better Care Support Teams Learning and Development Programme designed to support local areas in delivering integrated care in ways that make sense to you. Because one thing we've really learned, of course, is that one size doesn't fit all. Um, we developed the uh, logic model, which my colleague Deborah Rosansky shortly to go through, um, extensively engaging with yourselves in what it feels like locally, what's working well, what's not so well, what are the pressure points, priorities, and so on. So this is not something prescribed from uh, on high. It describes what good looks like through a very simple and visual depiction of how a well-integrated health system, health and care system, I should say, might be structured and how it might function, and the outcomes and benefits it should deliver. As I say, Deborah's going to present on this shortly. She's one of our Sky Associates, very, uh, very experienced in the area. We're running for an hour, so we'll finish at 12.30. Ask questions, bash away as we go along, make comments to our presenters. Type messages in the chat box that you see on the screen and hitting the return uh, button. Um, we'll read out some of the questions. Now we're trying to identify some of the themes for Deborah to talk through. Um, and uh, this is a great way of having a really good, uh, really good conversation. We're also recording the webinar and we're going to be putting it on our Social Care Institute for Excellence website afterwards along with your questions and comments. So uh, we're going to make you all stars today as well. Okay, Deborah, so I think that's over to you. Okay, great. Thank you, Tony. Hello, everyone. My name is Deborah Rosansky, and um, as Tony mentioned, I've been working with colleagues at Sky uh, both to develop the integrated care logic model and to work with local areas and how it might be used to uh, develop integrated care and progress integrated care uh, plans and programs locally. So it's, it, it's one of the things we're going to recover today is how to use the logic model, but also uh, focus specifically about how we might measure progress towards integration and how the logic model uh, gives us some clues as to what can be measured uh, what we might want to be looking at both locally and in relation to the available metrics nationally. Um, and as Tony mentioned, we will be uh, probably pausing at various points to pick up some questions yeah. um, uh, based on various themes. Um, we'd like to have a bit more of a dialogue in this uh, presentation rather than just a plenary with some questions at the end. So let's see how things go. Yeah. Our first slide just provides an overview of what we've been doing over the past two years. Originally, Sky was asked by the Department of Health and Social Care to test out what was called at that time an integration standard. And it was tested out with a variety of stakeholders nationally um, and locally, um, as well as with service users. We undertook some scoping research to see what, what might be included in an integration standard. The intention at that time was to have a means uh, at central government to evaluate how well integrated care was progressing across the country and to compare local progress. Um, what the integration standard originally contained focused a lot on some of what we now call the enablers for integrated care, such as data interoperability and leadership and partnership working. Um, and I'll come back to some of those things uh, in a few moments. Over the course of our research, we, look, we, did, uh, we undertook some literature research as well as some applied research in the field. Um, what we found was that we needed to have a wider perspective of integrated care, uh, not just the components of it, but also the benefits of integrated care, you know, focusing again on the fundamental purpose. Uh, why are we doing this? Uh, it's a massive endeavor, especially if we're trying to bring different services together. 
So what we created, working with people like yourselves as well as policymakers, was a framework to develop a wider integration scorecard. Um, and we'll describe that in detail in a few moments. We also undertook further research uh, to, to refine that framework and ultimately, about a little over a year ago, published what we called our logic model for integrated care. Um, and I will share that with you. Got through here. So what's in the logic model? Well, first of all, if you're not familiar with the approach of a logic model, it's used extensively for uh, evaluating programs and policies. Um, and it, it explains how, if you will, uh, what you put into a program, the inputs itself and the activities you engage in, produce particular outputs and outcomes. Um, what we did in, in the Sky Logic model around integrated care was to describe how different enablers and components of an integrated care system would lead to improved outcomes in three ways. Focusing on service users, focusing on health and care services, meaning how well they are coming together and the quality of those services, and also on the wider health and care system. One of the things that we stressed in developing the logic model was its fundamental purpose. And what we're talking about here is creating a system that is focused on person-centered, coordinated care. Um, and that for different types of service users who require a broad range of services, that coordination of that care enables them to have a seamless experience. And that's one of the things that we stressed in, 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 the, in, in the model itself. We drew upon a, a number of existing programs as well as research uh, to identify best practice uh, in, in certain components of the logic model. Some of those uh, things we drew from were the vanguards, which were the new care models, uh, some of the local system reviews that the CQC was developing as well as academic research, and indeed, some of the integration pioneers looking at some of the early evaluation evidence, for example. One of the things the logic model does is identify how we might measure the impact in relation to the three areas on this slide, the service users, health and care services, and the wider health and care system. And we suggested a number of outcomes that we would like to measure. The challenge has been whether or not we are able to measure those particular outcomes. Yeah, Deborah, that's really interesting, isn't it? Because I've just noticed this uh, comment from Steve McHugh. Hi, Steve. Uh, saying um, you're very interested in what are the local outputs and indicators that, of course, are the route through to the improved outcomes that uh, Deborah's talking about. So maybe we can get some chat going about that. And yes, I've noticed you like the I statements. Absolutely, yeah. Yes, and the I statements actually were very instrumental in some of the... Um, uh, the things that we put into the logic model, and I will be coming up with uh, uh, some suggestion ways of measuring uh, local outputs in relation to people's experience, uh, founded on the same principles as the I statements, just to reassure you. So before I show the logic model, I just want to describe the different areas. We've got uh, the enablers of integration where we have uh, identified some of the contextual factor factors that create what we call the preconditions for integrated care. These include such things as leadership and governance, partnership arrangements, joint budgets, joint commissioning, and so forth. The components of integrated care uh, list the types of interventions or activities that have been seen across the country uh, that create integration, and they cover a range of, in, uh, of interventions from proactive management of care to the use of multidisciplinary teams to other approaches to personalizing care, for example. We'll run through those in a moment. As I mentioned in the previous slide, we also have a section on the outcomes and then the impacts, the long-term benefits. Uh, these are based on the convention of the triple aim. Some of you may be familiar with that, which is about the, the uh, impact on health and well-being, on enhancing quality, and providing best value. So I know this may be difficult for you to read. Uh, this is the logic model for integrated care. It is available for downloading from the SKY website. 
If you in the future would like to print it off, I suggest you do it on an A3 sized paper. Uh, it's the best way to read it. But the reason it's so large is because it really does have a lot of content. Um, as you can see in the, the left hand column, which is sort of purplish blue on your screen, we have uh, the list of enablers for integrated care. In the next column, we have the components of integrated care. And I'll co cover those in a moment. Then we have the outcomes, which we've organized in three different areas, people's experience of care, services, and the system effects. The impact, as I said, is based on the tri triple uh, aim, which we've got the improved health and well-being, enhanced quality of care, value, and sustainability. Some of you might notice there's this other little column right smack in the middle between the components of integrated care and outcomes, which we've identified as outputs to be determined locally. And I'll explain what that is in a moment. So enablers, what have we got in the enablers? These include such things as um, local contextual factors, so the financial health of the local uh, area, funding arrangements, demographics, and so forth. System-wide governance and systems leadership, so the quality of that. Uh, how well um, electronic records and sharing of data uh, is, is how well that's, that, that's undertaken in your local community and how much progress you're making about record sharing um, and so forth. There's other things around integrated workforce, uh, investments in um, training, for example, of multidisciplinary teams, um, and a number of other things here. Okay, there's a joined up regular. Some things are really for national uh, uh, partners, but most of these are for local partners to evaluate to see how well you're doing, what your starting point is, and where you might go. The components of integrated care, as I said, it's, it's a long list here. Um, but it starts with thinking about how people journey through the system. So first we asked the question, who benefits from integrated care? Um, our charge from the Department of Health and Social Care was initially to focus on older people, people 65 and older who have multiple chronic conditions or have had multiple uh, hospital admissions who might be identified as being those people for whom a package of health and social care services would be most beneficial. However, as we took the logic model out into the field um, and sought feedback from, from local areas, um, we, are, we, we know it can be adapted to include uh, services for, for people who are um, using mental health services, different population groups, and so forth. So some of the components are specific for older people, and others could be adapted for wider or different groups of people. So how do we identify the people who are most likely to benefit from integrated care? That's one of the first questions. So what approaches are our are, are local areas taking to identify those people? Some call it risk stratification, but there are other things that people are doing. Um, it's, we're not saying this is exactly how you do it, but this is one of the main components, identifying the people who are going to most benefit from the care. We also have uh, a couple things here around prevention and personalization. So how is the system and the interventions enabling a focus on prevention and proactive care, not just through statutory services, but also working with the local voluntary sector. Most important, we have uh, some components related to care coordination. So for instance, how are people's needs being assessed jointly? Is there joint care planning? How are those care plans uh, managed? Uh, is there a care manage, uh, management across the whole system, uh, not only within primary and community services, but also in and out of the hospital setting? One of the other things relates to access to community services, especially out of hours, the availability of services, uh, not just um, uh, health care, but also social care out of hours. Is there a joint approach to crisis management? Is there a single point of access, for example? Um, looking uh, at how well people are, professionals are able to work across organizations and within multidisciplinary teams whether or not there are safe and timely transfers of care, 
um, and so forth. I'm not going to cover all of them here, but as you can see, there's quite a few different components of care. The outcomes uh, that we've specified in the third column here, I think, are really what we need to focus on today. What we've done in, in the people's experience uh, is base some of these outcomes specifically on the I statements. I know we've had that question about that. Um, the services, what we're focusing on here is how well services are being coordinated and how well they're managed um, and the extent to which they are proactive um, and supporting people uh, when there are transfers of care between care settings. And in terms of the system effects, we're looking at things like uh, the impact, especially on the higher cost acute services, as you can imagine, uh, there's still an emphasis on delayed transfers of care uh, in the measurements because of what we can measure. But also we're looking at the capacity of the system to respond to increasing demand. So is there a workforce available um, and is it well trained? Um, and indeed, how well are organizations working with each other? I'm just going to pause right this second to see if there are any more questions about the logic model before I move forward. Yeah, I hope um, it's uh, kind of really clear that uh, it's how enablers lead through to impact. And this is kind of like a, um, a well thought through and a well tested uh, checklist in some ways, really. That localities, I uh, was speaking to somebody in Essex just last week, Deborah, mm -hmm. uh, their integrated care manager, and they're using it really effectively in their health and well being oh, okay. to stimulate conversations there and possibly to use it to compare with other areas uh, too. All right, we've got some comments coming through here. Okay. This makes model a lot makes a lot of sense. Well, thank you, Joanne. That's, uh, that's a relief. <laughs> 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 um, is it a new model? Well, do you want to say something about that, Deborah? Well, it's, it's not necessarily new. As I said, we published uh, the SkyLogic model just over a year ago. It was based on research as well as engagement with uh, people like yourselves, as well as policy. Uh, makers um, and uh, it has been used uh, extensively by policymakers, but also, as Tony mentioned, by by local areas. What we're finding is that people are using it uh, in sort of three or four ways. One is to uh, make sure that there's a, a coherent strategy locally. You know, are people looking at are there the right enablers in place and the components understood, um, and are we able to measure the outcomes uh, as we'd like? Um, the, other, the other thing that people are doing is using it to evaluate their programs um, as well as to monitor their progress. Um, so it, it's being used in different ways. Um, also for local accountability, as Tony mentioned, some places are using it with their local health and well-being board. And it's a way of tracking some progress. But it really is intended to be a guide. It's not uh, definitive, you must do all of the things in it. Um, it allows for local areas to be flexible and adapt what's, what's in the logic model to local circumstances. I mean, again, as, as we're saying, that, I think it's real strength. Uh, so we're not taking credit, it's, it's, a, it, it's a pulling together of, uh, of a whole series of testing in a, in, a, in a number of areas. So if it didn't make sense, you know, we really would have missed something. But uh, yeah. Um, Julia, you're saying it would be great to use locally in your integrated service in Southampton, so that's good. That's precisely what it's there for, really. And yeah, again, continued focus on the I statements. Mm -hmm. um, any positive approach to supporting your work as a neighborhood at uh, MDT, Steve? Um, I don't know, maybe that's something that we can pick up, but I hope it will be a tool to support that. And I love that description from Chris there. Uh, about seeing this as a way through uh, uh, wicked, wicked systems. Uh, but yes, I mean, it's a good point. You know, this can look quite, you know, we put it on a page, but the downside is it's very intense. Are there ways in presenting this that, you know, makes sense to a wider citizen, people, service user audience? Maybe there, maybe there are, maybe that's something, Deborah, I'm just thinking we could perhaps take back to the Department yeah. of Health and Social Care to talk about. Sure. Sure, it's really helpful. And we will have some practical examples coming up in a moment about how this uh, logic model has been used locally. So I will be showing you that, as well as how uh, MDTs might be uh, using some of the measures, specifically some of the things, uh, the outcomes under the services and people's experience. Okay, I'm going to go on. So as I mentioned, the logic model is being used widely. Um, it's 
again, very difficult to read, but just so you know, it's been picked up by uh, national policy makers, um, NHS England's Integrating Better program, the Care Quality Commission based some of its local system reviews on the logic model, especially how health and social, cares, uh, social care organizations are relating to each other. Um, we've got obviously some, com some reporting in the Better Care Fund that incorporates elements of the logic model. Uh, we have uh, the National Audit Office looked at the interface between health and social care and reported on it. Uh, there's a recent report also from the LGA. Anyway, it goes on and on. So I think what we've got here is a model that is comprehensive enough to engage a wide range of policymakers as well as local audiences. One of the things that um, I'll be sharing uh, a little bit later is what Sky is doing next with the, com the content that underpins the logic model, creating an online integrated care resource and how that might be used locally. So as I said, the tool can be used to inform strategic planning and delivery, uh, the monitoring and evaluation of integrated care. Um, and uh, what we're finding is that local partners are using this to establish their strengths and weaknesses in relation to some of the key enablers and the components, um, the extent to which plans exist for implementing the key components of care, such as MDTs, uh, how person-centered some of the interventions are, um, and the extent to which the plans are actually uh, supporting the delivery of integrated care. W one of the, the areas that people keep asking of us, us about is how do we actually measure progress towards integrated care. Um, and as we've advised the department, it's really important to remember that the goal isn't just integrated care. What we're saying in this model is that the goal is for people to have a better experience of care as a result of the integration of health and social care. So keeping one's mind and services focused ultimately on individuals and their experiences, and indeed the experiences of their carers and families, is what drives this model forward. Yes, Deborah, and um, I've noticed Stephen McHugh's point. Uh, is it, is it, uh, oh no, John, sorry. Yeah, the importance of people's experience um, as as really the key outcome that matters much more so than uh, than how well the system's working and so on. Systems are, are after all only a means to an end uh, at the end of the day. I'm yeah. Curious. And I, I see Julia mentioned that if all the enablers aren't in place, it's much harder to progress integration on the ground, and that's absolutely true. And uh, we'll come up with a, a little bit of, with, with a self-assessment tool that you might want to use to kind of establish uh, where you are with some of those enablers and the relative strengths and weaknesses of your current stage and where you need to go. But you're absolutely right. Um, the reason the enablers are listed as they are is because we found both from experiences out in the field and the literature that those enablers were absolutely essential. Uh, Deborah, I'll say um, as, as well, um, Stephen McHugh describing uh, government as, quote, the bump in the road. Yeah. And it, it, can, it can feel like that. But I think, uh, you know, areas that are doing well um, on integration are really trying to focus on the things that they do have control of as opposed to the things that they don't. And of course, you're quite right. There are still completely different, you know, funding mechanisms, uh, what different parts of the system are accountable for, and mm -hmm. so on, really. And, and it can be tricky. I suppose we'd simply say, you know, be as positive as you can and uh, make things work as best you possibly can. And um, so we don't lose it later on from Steve S uh, about community assets and social capital. Absolutely. I mean, this links with uh, strength based working, doesn't it, Derek? Mm -hmm. We've been doing a lot on as well for both people and uh, communities. This uh, logic model uh, has taken as its uh, starting point really very much the health social care axis. And in a way, that's a limitation. But equally, it's an enabler in itself, because if we can't get the health social care access working, then nothing else can uh, it, it, it can't. It, is, it is in itself an important enabler. But yes, people have made points about housing, leisure, yep, all, absolutely. Sorts, all sorts of other things that make a difference to lives of people. Who use absolutely. Services. And that's why we said if you're thinking about the individual, then, then those other factors are really important, because you're thinking about the quality of their lives, and what, what enhances that through an integrated approach. Yeah. And it's interesting here, there's another comment about uh, helping service users and clinicians to work in a common way. And some of the behavior change associated 
uh, with integrated care is something that we sort of alluded to in the model. Uh, it's very difficult to measure, but we certainly recognize that, that integrated care is a journey. It's not something that just happens because you, you say it's going to happen. Uh, focusing on uh, people, especially let's say in multidisciplinary teams, uh, and getting them to work differently and to um, involve service users directly um, is, is something that takes concerted effort. It doesn't happen overnight. So uh, the next thing we've been doing is, as I said, figuring out how we're going to measure uh, integrated care, whether it's actually happening, whether we're progressing. There's an interest on the part of the Department uh, of Health and Social Care to know whether or not you know, things are improving nationally, what, what's working well, what isn't. Um, and what, we've, what we have done in our most recent research, which is not yet published, uh, but I'll give you a few um, insights, is that we've identified some potential approaches and practical tools for how we might measure the outcomes of integrated care. Um, and again, just to re refresh, it's in those three areas. One is about people's experience of care. The second is about the services and how well they're co being coordinated and, and their outcomes. And then the third area is at a system level. What we did is we looked extensively at routinely collected measures. Uh, and those come from uh, the, the national data sets that you might all be familiar with. Uh, both from the NHS and from social care. Some of them are survey-related uh, uh, data sets. Others are collected from activities, such as the hospital, hospital episode statistics. But what we found is that they do not adequately measure integration of health and social care in a number of ways. But most important is that they, they have a, a gap in, in helping us understand people's experience of, of care. And coming back to the I statements, we know that it, we, we shouldn't be asking just are people satisfied with care. We need to understand um, their experience of care in a number of domains. Uh, do they have access to information? Is there good communication with the professionals? Um, are they involved in shared decision making? Are they involved in uh, joint care planning? Um, and those sorts of things. So those, those sorts of gaps currently exist. Um, and we have a few suggestions that I'll share with you about how we might advance our understanding of people's experience. Just to say, we did look internationally to see whether there might be some metrics that have been used in other uh, health systems uh, that we could perhaps pilot here and, and test a little bit further. Um, and it's quite interesting. I think our main conclusion, having talked to experts internationally and reviewed the literature, is that this is an evolving situation um, that there is no right or wrong, but, but the metrics that we might be able to use, there are some possibilities that have actually uh, emerged from this country and uh, could be quite useful to you. The second area where there's a gap um, comes back to the issue around system maturity and having all the enablers in place. So how mature those systems are, there's a, a strong relation to how well, how well people are experiencing an integrated, well-coordinated system. Um, so how you evaluate those enablers, such as leadership and culture, relationships, ways of working, is important. And continuing to focus on improving those things is going to be instrumental in delivering a better integrated health and social care system overall. As I said, the measurement of integrated care outcomes is an emerging field. Um, and ultimately, that's because there is a wide variation and complexity in the way we look at integrated care services, the care arrangements, and delivery models. So comparing, for example, different systems, um, I'm comparing different systems and comparing different models of care, it, it's difficult to actually come up with um, just a, a, a set of factors that can be used uh, to compare one system to another. However, there are some interesting studies across Europe that have done that um, and help us focus on a small handful of areas. What we found is that by focusing on the following things, you can really start to accelerate integration on the ground, and they do represent good value. Focusing, for instance, on what it takes to improve care coordination and the continuity of care 
particularly in primary care community settings and at home. So what are those things that you're doing locally that are going to deliver that? The second is to focus on care coordination and continuity at transitions between care settings. And the third is eliminating specific barriers to integration. Um, so as, as we all know, the interoperability of care records and having fully compatible data systems. Some of that is very difficult to achieve, but those really, that really does make a difference in the long run. So what are we doing now? We have suggested to the department that we need to make the most of the metrics that are currently available, that we need to uh, explore collectively how we develop new metrics to understand people's experience of care, and we need to support local areas so that they can better assess their maturity of their local systems and improve uh, what uh, the, the enablers in particular to deliver integrated care. Those are our, what we're recommending. And I think what we'd like to hear from you um, as, we, as we have, I think we've got like half an hour left, um, are some of the things uh, in relation to our recommendations. So what we're suggesting um, in relation to how we make the most of existing metrics is that local areas create their own local dashboards. And those dashboards would combine a core set of best available metrics from routinely collected national data sets with some of your own locally derived measures. Some of those might be very sort of process measures, like how many people are uh, receiving care plans. Um, but some of, and I'll come to what that content might look like. But it would be good to hear from you, if you are using your own local dashboards, what kind of metrics you are including. I'm just thinking, Deborah, as well, that uh, that comment from uh, Steve S. there about uh, where you can look for measures of integrated leadership. I mean, that's a very complicated one. Yeah. Especially when it, it feels very qualitative, like the comment from Steve McHugh just above it talks about, uh, well, actually, this all this moves at the speed of trust. Yeah. Um, I think I, I would advise, um, we uh, here at Sky, we, we, we led the support for the 20, now 23 areas which were subject to um, the um, CQC local system reviews of how well, uh, what people's pathways were like you know, through health and social care. And there's a lot in those reports and the CQC and indeed our own final reports mm -hmm. about uh, what are the real keys to uh, working well across the system. And I would agree with you, uh, Steve, you're quoting from a report there, aren't you? It moves at the speed of trust. But there's a lot about how that operates in different localities in those reports and in the CQC and our own summary reports which you can find on our website. Yeah, and there's no substitute for good relations um, because that has, that it has a, a direct effect on how resources can be used collectively and how available they are, especially to local teams that need to draw down those resources to provide integrated care. Yeah. So, so um, you know, it's absolutely right. It is very subjective, but we will, I will share in a moment at some tools uh, that you might want to use, a self-assessment tool called Scirocco which I've identified in the third uh, thing here. Um, how will we know if the foundations of in, an integrated care system are maturing and evolving? Um, there's also the work that the LGA and others have done, um, and we are going to be developing some other tools. We're working with um, one local area up in Manchester, for example, on applying the logic model to develop a self-assessment tool that enables us to answer that question. How will we know if the foundations of integrated care systems are maturing and evolving? But again, remember, we, is, we don't have definitive answers. It's all e emerging. And uh, the more you focus on the right things, the better off you'll be over the long run. Okay. So again, why create a local dashboard? Um, because we know that the national metrics are insufficient to tell you uh, how well you're doing locally. Some of the national metrics, as I'll describe in a moment, don't also have the same sensitivity to some of the interventions that you're putting in place locally. And there are some things that you'll want to measure locally that are much more important to you or much more important to your health and well-being board. On this slide here, I've described the advantages and disadvantages of using different types of, of metric sources. So if you were to rely solely on national data sets and surveys, um, uh, one of the, some of the advantages include that the data are already collected and reported, so there's no additional burden or cost to you to use it. Um, the metrics are understood. They're already used to judge system performance. Um, they'll include a number of health indicators as well as some of the service indicators. 
but the disadvantages are that they're frequently not timely. Um, they're also not necessarily uh, reflecting the people who've received integrated care. So for example, uh, let's take data from the uh, even the adult social care survey or the GP survey. Whilst the adult social care survey is a group of people who've received social care services in the past 12 months, they're not necessarily the same group of people who have received integrated packages of care. And similarly, uh, on the GP survey, although we ask the question, have people uh, received a care plan, we don't ask about their uh, involvement in that care plan, nor their experience of receiving uh, coordinated care, how well they, they feel it's been coordinated. So there's some, some gaps, again, in the national data. We also know that a lot of the system measures are very focused on acute care outcomes, um, and hence the uh, more recent focus on DTOC in particular. Um, we know that some of the measures in the acute care sector, such as emergency admissions and DTOC, have multiple influences. So it's not necessarily that these are adverse outcomes of a system that's not coordinating care well. There may be other reasons why uh, there is a rise in emer emergency admissions uh, and unplanned care, for example. Um, and most important, the metrics are not assessing integrated care per se. If you have your local indicators, however, you can, if they're drawn from validated tools and instruments, then you'll have some um, information that's more specific to the interventions that you put in place locally. A lot of times this is qualitative information. Uh, specific to, uh, let's say, a neighborhood-based program that you're, you're testing. It's not necessarily at scale, uh, but it is obviously giving you much more immediate feedback to the work that you're doing. It will test interventions. It will help you focus on improvement. Um, and it will include a lot of process measures that can be recorded over time and tracked with run charts and that sort of thing. The real disadvantages of local data is that it requires you to actually collect it, have a means of doing it. You might have to go through some ethical approval process to collect it as well. Um, there might be aggregation challenges. So if you, for instance, are, uh, if you have a program that covers, let's say, 10 different neighborhoods, um, if you're using tools that are, have not been uh, evaluated uh, for their ability to bring the data together in an aggregated way, then it's not really clear that you can understand what's happening across the whole local area. You might have a neighborhood view, but not necessarily across the whole local area. And it's, it's, a, it's, it's a, I'm getting into some rather sort of detailed bit here, but there are some data aggregation challenges with local data. So that's it. So what kind of indicators might you use? This, again, this is this slide will be made available to you after today. I, I realize it's very difficult to read on the screen. What we looked at were the available indicators around the system efficiency measures, people's experience, and user outcomes in relation to some of the things that we determined from the literature are really important to delivering better integrated care outcomes, such as, um, oops, we're hearing some echoes. Hold on. Are we OK now? OK, sorry for the technical problem there. Um, the care that, that people receive out of hospital, how well that's being coordinated, the care at transitions, uh, we've looked at the frequency with which the data are collected and which programs are already collecting it so that there's some consistency in approach. The system efficiency indicators are largely the ones that you would recognize. These again are mostly related to acute sector uh, variables. For example, delayed transfers of care, emergency admissions for people 65 and, and over, unplanned hospital admissions for chronic ambulatory care sensitive conditions, uh, emergency readmissions, uh, length of stay, uh, total bed days, um, the effectiveness of reablement, re and so forth. So there's a few things here that you will, I think, be quite familiar with. In terms of people's experience of care, we've, we've picked up a number of uh, questions that are collected from the GP survey and the adult social care survey uh, in particular. So for example, the proportion of patients with care plans in place who have hel who helped des to design them, find them useful, and are helped regularly to re review them. That's from the GP survey. The proportion of people feeling supported to manage their long-term conditions, that's also in the GP survey. 
Now, mind you, the people answering the GP survey are not necessarily those who have received integrated care, integrated packages of care, but this, these, these are helpful data points. Um, from the uh, adult social care survey, there's a question around service user choice and control. So we've got two questions on that. I'm not going to go through the detail here, but these are some of the things that we've included in this chart. There may be other measures that you want to use locally, such as patient activation measures, quality of life measures that have also been collected elsewhere. Um, there's the Warwick Edinburgh scale, for example, on that. So there are things that can be used uh, combined with the national measures to create your local data, your local um, uh, dashboard. I'm trying to see what's come through. All right, so with these, I just wanted to remind everybody about sort of the six domains that uh, underpin person-centered coordinated care and which have emerged as a result of, uh, I think, the general consensus around the use of the I statements. Yeah. So um, these have been put together into sort of six major do main domains and, and a few subdomains, but they focus on uh, what we've heard about being able to set one's own goals in relation to care, uh, including around care planning, such as care management and single point of access, Transitions of care, i.e. continuity of care, involvement in decision making, information and communication, um, and that includes, you know, the knowledge of the patient for self-management, for example, and then the organizational process activities, for lack of a better word, but that's really about, um, uh, for instance, valuing physical and mental health equally, how proactive some of the care management is. Um, access to appointments and out-of-hour support, the training for staff, and so forth. So these are the areas that relate to person-centered coordinated care. And the reason we're presenting these is that we have discovered this really interesting survey instrument that you might want to use. Uh, it has the illustrious name of P3C-EQ, P3C meaning person-centered coordinated care. Um, and on this slide and the following slide, we have listed the questions that have been used in that questionnaire. It's been developed out of Plymouth University with support from NHS England and the Southwest uh, Academic Health Science uh, Network. Uh, some of the vanguards have used this as well as a number of evaluation schemes looking at integrated care specifically. And the questions, there are um, 11 questions, actually two parts to uh, some of the two or three parts to some of them. Um, but these all relate to the six domains that I've described around person-centered coordinated care. And it's an available instrument. It's available freely. It can be found on the Plymouth University website, and we will share that, that link with you in a few moments. Um, but as you can see, I'll go back one moment, they're very much designed to collect information about the person's experience of integrated care. And they cover everything from information to shared decision making to uh, engagement with professionals, um, communication, uh, how well you can manage your own health and care, and so forth. Okay. We also discovered some interesting tools that you might want to consider using to assess system maturity. Across the whole of the EU, there's something that's called the Scirocco model, um, and it's assessment, assessment tool of some of the, what we would call the enablers in the logic model, but the components that need to be in place locally. Uh, and it's quite interesting. The International Foundation for Integrated Care was really involved in its development and the research. They're also looking for partners to try to roll out the tool further. Um, and I'll show you what it looks like on the next slide. There's still the stepping up to the place self-assessment tool that the LGA uh, has been using in the past few years. Uh, it's going to be updated, so there will be some something new coming about that. Um, and um, as I mentioned, we're working with one of the local care organizations in Manchester to design a, an self-assessment tool that focuses specifically on integrated neighborhood working, so not as much on the enablers, but what's happening uh, at a very local level, at the neighborhood level. So these are in development, some of these things. The Scirocco model is presently available. Um, it's probably hard to read this one, too. I'm sorry about that. But uh, we'll provide you with the link, 
and you can look at it. There are online some, um, not only the tool that you can use for self-assessment, most likely with your uh, system leaders, but also some videos about how to use it. Um, and we can, at Sky, advise you as well um, as the, at the uh, International Foundation for Integrated Care. But what does it cover? In terms of the maturity model, it looks at the ambition, which is really the leadership ambition of local areas, how focused local areas are on capacity building, citizen empowerment, evaluation methods, uh, how resources are funding, how the system is funded, uh, the extent to which uh, things have been digitalized, how innovation is supported, whether there's a population approach uh, within the integrated care system, the readiness to change, it looks at also at removing some of the barriers or inhibitors to integrate that would enable integrated care, uh, standardization and simplification of some of the measures, and the stru overall structure and governance of the system. Earlier, someone asked if there was a, a, an example of a local dashboard. And I realize, again, this is difficult to read online. But yes, this is one of them. Uh, we've, we've taken out the identifier, but it is essentially one local area that has used the SkyLogic model to say, OK, how can we identify what it is we need to measure? So they've come up with the green bits here, which you'll be able to read when, when, you, when you sort of blow up your screens a bit more, um, are the me metrics that have been agreed locally and will be tracked over time. Some of them relate to the interventions. Some of them relate specifically to some of the outputs, some of their sort of local measures, and some relate to the outcomes as we've, as we've described them. I mentioned much earlier that we are developing an online integration resource, uh, which will enable people to identify not only the evidence and best practice underlying the logic model, but include some, some top tips and tools and kind of how-to approaches from case studies to take forward all of the different elements of the logic model. And uh, we will be launching the beta version, I think January, but certainly uh, in the next few months. Uh, we're still testing it at the moment, um, but we will be really keen to get your feedback and to see how it's used. A lot of it will be signposting users to the resources of other organizations. Um, and that way, we're, we're bringing together in an aggregate way uh, what's out there, not only for the Better Care Fund, but for other, um, uh, from other international sources, sources and national programs. We will be, as I mentioned, developing a self-assessment tool with the Manchester Local Care Organization. And this will be a tool that can be used very locally to assess how well uh, services are being coordinate, coordinated on a, on a neighborhood basis locality basis. Um, as, as new evidence and policy emerge, we'll be updating the logic model. Um, and uh, the department or cross government, there will be a consideration of the options for how we improve the measurement of integrated care, the metrics that might be used in particular around people's experience of care. So some of the things we're doing are advising uh, how we might, for example, revise some of the existing surveys so that we get better information. Um, or it might also mean how do we incorporate uh, experience measures in the personal care record. So, okay, yeah, and that's, and back uh, to and that's how you get some uh, further uh, information. Mm -hmm. Deborah, if you just have a quick look at those. I'm looking at some of the questions here. Well. But um, um, in the meantime, you know, we do um, on our site feature, you know, interesting blogs of the way people have uh, tackled some of the wicked issues around this complex area. Um, if anybody wants us to make contact with us with a view to uh, to that, you know, please, please do. Uh, we want to provide uh, kind of be, well, be a repository of experience and perhaps wisdom on what works and why, really. Yeah. Um, so you know, don't don't hesitate to keep in touch and keep this keep this really lively. Don't present in there. You want yeah. To. So one of the questions was, are there examples of how local models change in relation to service user experience of their system? Um, the examples that I've seen uh, have been through evaluations of integrated care programs. Um, and uh, you could get in touch with me, and I could send some of those to you if you'd like. Um, some of them are, um, again, some pan-European studies. And they've used, in particular, people's experience 
measures as a way of improving um, the coordination of care through multidisciplinary teams, for instance, uh, improving or getting rid of the barriers between organizations. So there may be some impediments to better coordination. So because of people's experience, it's identified some of those things. Um, so yes, there are some examples. They're not, they're not uh, large examples, but they have been studied as par part of a number of evaluations. Um, there's another point about the dashboard being not just dominated by healthcare. That was the intention. Uh, we want to make sure that we're picking up on the uh, availability of local assets as well. Um, so it's social care, it's health care, but it's also uh, uh, people's own assets, family's assets, and indeed the wider community. It's really important that we think of, of integrated care as a system endeavor. Um, as Tony mentioned earlier, in some places, housing is very instrumental in the delivery system, and that's one thing that some areas are doing. We want the, the logic model to be used as a way, in a flexible way, picking up on what's, what the local context is. Um, information governance. Yes, it is quite difficult. I think through our uh, online digital resource, we'll be able to provide some useful examples, not just case studies, but if people have some interesting agreements, MOUs, and so forth, we can share what those things are. Um, if there are more things that colleagues can share, there's always the BCST um, uh, online platform. Um, I don't have any examples at hand here. Um, but it is absolutely essential that there is good information governance for the system to work. I'm just seeing, Deborah, that Julia um, in Southampton says they do have a data sharing yeah. agreement, which seems, to be, which seems to be working well. So, you know, again, the real, um, you know, the real power, the real strength really is uh, out there, the way that, um, you know, good positive systems are doing their best despite the... Uh, despite the complexities, to find a kind of a sensible way through that makes a difference. And yeah. We're very keen to be a, a repository of, of, of what works at, at Sky. So as I said before as well, if anybody's got you know, blogs or information on things that are working well, just um, you know, fire, fire it in here. Really. I'm just looking over at our communications manager who's uh, nodding rather than grimacing, so that's good. Um, yeah. So there's a question about who owns the integrated logic model. I guess I would sort of turn that on its head to say who who is ultimately accountable for delivering better better care and outcomes to your local community. The logic model is, is just a guide that can be used. Um, ultimately, there needs to be uh, a very clearly stated local ambition about integrated care and what it's going to deliver and who will benefit from it. Um, and then the how. So, so how are you approaching the delivery of, of, of integrated care? What are the components of it? And how you're going to measure progress and be accountable for it. So in some places, it's the local health and well-being board. In other cases, there are joint boards uh, that involve uh, the CCG with local government. Um, but all the, tool, the model itself is simply a tool. Um, it doesn't mean that you have to be following it uh, to a T. There may be elements that are specific to your local situation. And um, as was being said earlier in this uh, webinar, um, in some areas you may want to extend this beyond that more narrow health and social Absolutely. care um, axis, really. Um, as I said, you know, some uh, we were well aware of the impact of housing, leisure, um, all sorts on people's experiences, and that sort of general drive to uh, for strength-based working for both people um, and communities. And, and again, we'll be very interested to know how you develop the tool to make sense uh, locally, given your own priorities and ambitions. Mm -hmm. we, when we when we built the um, the logic model, we did involve representatives from the third sector, or military sector, as well as uh, service users. Um, and so we found that the model did resonate with everybody. So it is an attempt to be fairly inclusive. Um, and if you have a, a clear ambition and, and local area that is articulated well, um, how the system is supposed to work together, um, I think that is a really good way then to continue that engagement both in terms of service user groups and their expectations, but also more importantly, the voluntary sector um, and, and even the independent sector in terms of delivery through across the system. Okay, well I think we're um, probably there actually. Well, I'll just see a few more Steve, questions. Steve McHugh's been pretty active on this uh, webinar. Thank you for that, yeah. Steve. You're busy typing at the moment. Um, and I'm waiting for that to flash up. But, yeah. uh, I think, I think uh, um, if, if there are metrics that you're using locally that you find have been really helpful, 
that would be something that would be really good to share. Yeah. Um, we and if you are using uh, your own local dashboard, uh, you know, again, we will be sharing some of these things online once our resource is, is up and running. Um, but if you have others that you'd like to send to us and, and you have permission to share them, then we'd be very happy to share them. Uh, most of these sorts of things are published. Um, and we can hear another comment. Uh, Steve has said the logic model is fantastic. Thank you. I won't take full credit for it, but we're very pleased you're using it. Um, and it can be adapted locally. That is really its intention. Um, some of the things that I've shared today about available metrics, uh, either through the, the P3C uh, instrument from Plymouth uh, or the Scirocco self-assessment tool for looking at enablers, uh, please get in touch if you need some further advice about how to use them. Okay, well, I think um, we'll wrap up at that point. Thank you for that final comment, um, Chris, as well. You know, as Deborah said, you know, we are seeking to um, uh, identify and build upon things that work for you out there in the field. Um, we're, this is certainly not a top-down uh, exercise as far as we're concerned. It never has been. The logic model itself is the product of uh, listening and learning from uh, your own experiences out there. And this webinar has been a great way for us to um, learn uh, more, and that's what we've done today. And uh, we've all been scribbling. There's, there's, there's five or six people in this room all scribbling away. So can I thank everybody for participating this morning. Have a great rest of the day. I hope the weather's better where you are than it is here. And have a great weekend. Thank you very much. Over and out. Oh, Deborah. And thank you very much. <laughs> like I said, I put my, my uh, uh, email and uh, Twitter feed if you want to get in touch with me. Thanks Big again. Big thank you, Deborah, for leading us through that. Bye, everybody. <laughs>